Hey there, and welcome to another episode of The Dark Parade. I am Bo Ransdell. I am your host. We will soon be joined by one Lee Russell uh, to discuss the remake of Let the Right One In, Let Me In. And uh, I think you're going to really have a good time with this. We, You know, th this is a movie that I really wanted to talk about. I almost wanted to do this series more for Let Me In than Let the Right One In. And the reason for that is I remember seeing Let Me In and thinking, you know, if you're going to remake Let the Right One In, maybe this isn't the worst way to go about it. That it seemed like it had something to say. And I think you'll find during the course of the conversation that I have here with Lee that we really dig into it and find some things uh, about Let Me In that are different f from Let the Right One In, which is, I think is important when you're remaking a movie that's as good as Let the Right One In, uh, have something a little bit different to say with that material. Uh, it borrows from the novel in different ways, although it is very much a remake of the film uh, or an adaptation of the novel, uh, as, you know, that, that both of the films are drawn from. So um, it's really interesting. I think you're going to have a good time with this conversation because I think it goes some places uh, with, you know, sort of how we feel about remaking this kind of movie. And uh, and it was really satisfying. Like I said, I, I really wanted to talk about this movie almost as much as I wanted to talk about Let the Right One In uh, because I don't hate on this movie the way that some people do. And I... I think some of that is just sour grapes. I think there is uh, some quality to be found in this movie, but uh, I will let you be the judge here as Lee and I discuss this. Uh, thanks, as always, for joining us on this program, and welcome to The Dark Parade. All right, as promised, everyone, with me is the estimable Lee Russell to talk about uh, a remake that we will discuss whether it should have been. Mm. But uh, first of all, Lee, thanks so much for doing this. I I was telling you right before we start recording, I love this because I get to have people on to have one-on-one -on -one discussions where previously it was always kind of a group thing. Yeah. Oh, no, I... Uh Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I mean, we've only, I think we've only recorded once together on one of the round, round tables. I think that's right. I think it's only yeah. the one time. So I, I you know, and I, I've been in that situation with a number of uh, podcasters that I really enjoy. Like, I, I like listening to you. I like recording with you the, the one time that we did it. And so, then it was just like, well, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to make my own damn show. <laughs> <laughs> where I can talk to whoever I want. Um, <laughs> you're, you're big boy now. Yeah, exactly. I've I've grown. Mm -hmm. um, but like the they must be destroyed on site is the big show, right? Like I don't. Mm -hmm. What what else do you do besides that, if anything? Uh yeah. So you know the bit the big show is they must be destroyed on site, and that's been going on since 2014. ish I want to say now 2014, 2015, I think. Um, I do some side podcasts on that. Uh, I have one called uh, Blood on the Tracks, which is just me pretending to be a radio DJ, basically, and just playing music from films that I like. Uh, and usually each each episode has a theme, and I, I pick like a bunch of stuff that's interesting to me, or maybe even stuff I haven't heard until I researched it for the show. And I just sort of like give a little bit of tidbits of info. I try to limit as much as much talking as possible so i can fit as much music as possible into it um the other show uh i have is uh it's kind of on hiatus right now because my main co-host is busy with his podcast that actually makes money for him and is actually doing important work like fighting nazis and shit like that legit so i can't really like hey you want to come talk about superhero movies uh, this week daniel <laughs> no uh but it's called cape shit and we're sort of chronologically going through the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe. And actually, that show is more his brainchild. He's like, I really want to do this. So I was like, oh, okay, well, let's do it. And so it's kind of on hold until he until he comes back. But um, yeah, that's, that's 
pretty much all I do. There's some odds and ends here and there that pop up on the feed, but that's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. I I did the Marvel rewatch through quarantine, which I think everybody did at some mm-hmm. point. Um, and you know, definitely have my favorites out of that group for sure. But that's a fairly consistent production house. Yeah, they don't really they don't really fuck up all that much. They got their they pretty much got their game on every time they go out there. But uh, you know, the stuff that they <laughs> that maybe they're not too big on that stuff just shows up on disney plus like black widow and you know <laughs> <laughs> uh it, it's like it'll probably make us some money so here you go yeah yeah black i like the the weirdest thing about black widow which is why everyone you know is listening to this show to hear black widow mm-hmm. talk um I I found that the action sequences were the least interesting thing about Black Widow. Yeah, uh, they 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 looked kind of unfinished. Like they looked yeah like two thousands era CGI almost. I'm like, what's going on here? Why why didn't they finish this? <laughs> well, and also when the you have those moments where it's like you fell out of a plane, you mm-hmm. should not be alive right now. Yeah, her her durability changes from film to film. It's like. At some point, it's like it'd be nice if they could scale back and like, oh yeah, no, these are the superheroes that could die instantly if one of these big villains touched them, and you should probably not have them falling out of airplanes and surviving and shit. Like, you should set some limits, but you know, yeah. I, who am I? I'm not the one making these million dollar fucking big pictures that are breaking in billions, so what do I know? Right, fair enough. Hard, hard to argue. And the, uh, just this weekend, I caught up with uh, Shang-Chi and mm-hmm. and that was dope like that that movie's real cool um, i liked uh i liked that until right up until the final battle where it just became the typical yeah we fight big cgi monster yep a hundred percent yeah 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 like everything up to the point where he and his father have their big moment mm-hmm. i was like this this movie's rad and as soon as there was the giant soul sucker thing, I was like, oh, okay, well, this is just turning into the requisite Marvel movie. Yeah, but it was it was like a uh, it's very much like a um, crouching tiger, hidden dragon type thing, but like shoved into the Marvel universe. So yeah. like for a longest part of it, watching it, I was really appreciating it. And it's got some good jokes and mm-hmm. it's got some good side characters that get a bit more of a spotlight in that film and yeah i thought it was pretty good yeah aquafina is done no favors by the trailer for that movie (laughs) which made her sound just obnoxious Mm -hmm. and then when you see the film you're like oh she's actually a really charming fun character and uh was was not treated well by the by the whoever cut those trailers together Mm -hmm. but uh yeah yeah i could use a lot more kung fu in the marvel universe and i'm totally down for like a shang chi too i think oh yeah (laughs) we we definitely don't need iron fist too let's just stick with the shang chi yeah yeah. for sure like that whole bus sequence it was one of the best action sequences i've seen this year oh yeah that was good stuff um anyway like i said that's not what you came here to, to talk about we're talking about let me in which is of course the remake of let the right one in we're doing this uh you know it's december as this episode drops and it's that time of year the snowy time of year and i thought what better way to celebrate the cold outside than to uh you know dissect a remake of a near perfect movie (laughs) with which also has the same kind of themes of melancholy and loneliness and isolation. Um, but maybe, I don't know, we'll get into it. Uh, but uh, So were, did you jump on this right away? Like, had you seen Let the Right One In when Let Me In came out? Um, I I think I, if I'm remembering correctly, I think I actually saw this first. Okay. Um, because, because I... I rented this back in the day when you could still rent dvds (laughs) and so you know uh like our last struggling uh rental place that uh, no longer exists but uh i I was i was a frequent customer there and it's like oh this looks really interesting and i i looked this i put this in popped it popped it in watched it enjoyed it i was like oh this is a remake looked up 
the remake and then went and watched that afterwards. So, you know, are, did I say that right? Yeah, well, you, no, I, I watched the original afterwards. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I kind of had that experience with The Grudge where I saw mm-hmm. the American version, then went back and saw the Japanese version. And I kind of grew to prefer the Jap- the OG Japanese grudge, but I still have a very fond spot in my heart for the American grudge. Because uh, it was the the first, my first taste of that world where I was like, oh, wow, a movie where people just walk into a haunted house and they're fucked? I yeah. love this. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I love that the, the movie just basically shows you, oh yeah, they're fucked. No, they're fucked. No, that character too. That character's fucked. Well, what yeah. are you going to do, viewer? Yeah, Nothing. right. Yeah, you're every everybody that steps foot, crosses the threshold, is done for. Mm-hmm. Um, but is, is, what was your take on Let Me In the first time you saw it then? If, if you saw this one first, that... Mm-hmm. And I, which I'm going to say some things probably through the course of this conversation that sound very dismissive of, of this movie. And I don't mean it like that at all, because I actually do think this is a very quality film. Mm-hmm. It just lives in the shadow of let the right one in. Yeah. Um, I thought this was really good. Um, you know, it manages, it has a really good mood and feel to it. That is like unique from the original, um, I, f- I feel like it manages to set itself in the 1980s in America in a real convincing fashion. And other than, you know, a lot of the movies and stuff that set themselves in the 1980s day- these days where they're, they're telling you every second that it's the 1980s, I found this one was much more subtle in the way it did it. Like, at least it felt more subtle. Maybe it's just because of the pacing of the film. But, you know, you, you got your Reaganism, you got your satanic panic, you got your serial killers, your divorced parents, your rotary phones, your arcade machines. Uh, you got a couple pop songs in the soundtrack. And all of that stuff was, I think, placed really well to, to the point where it's like it's it's not distracting. It just like sucks you into the mood of the whole thing. And like I came at the other end of watching this film going like, you know, that's a really well done, subtle storytelling it's got a good balance of like pacing and like a, for a lack of dialogue, it, the the characters' performances give you a lot, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was like, "Wow, this is really fucking good!" And this is way before you know there was this big like prestige horror resurgence. You know, this is a few years before that, so um, it's kind of a precursor to like uh, some of the stuff we see now these days. I felt. Yeah. And especially coming from the, well, we know now what Matt Reeves is capable of. I think those apes movies are terrific, Mm -hmm. but at the time it was, Hey, the guy who made Cloverfield is remaking, let the right one in. And that sounds like a recipe for disaster, (laughs) but it turns out that Matt Reeves is actually a very thoughtful kind of filmmaker and does, he does right by the material. Mm-hmm. And I think you're right. I think uh, you, comparing it to something like Wonder Woman 84, for example, yeah. that is just like, hey, it's the 80s. Got it, kids? Where, yeah, as uh, this movie does drop in details, but they're very organic to the telling of the story. And, um, and I, all right, so that kind of leads us into the, the story itself. And obviously, spoilers, if you have never seen let the right one in or let me in then uh you should watch kind of both of those really and then yeah uh and then come back and listen to this uh but don't really do that just keep listening um but yeah so it starts in march of 83 and it's set in los alamos new mexico yeah and it begins with a scene that we'll catch up to later in the movie where um, the father character, as played by Richard Jenkins, is being taken by ambulance to this hospital where he is all checked up. Like They're like, hey, he poured acid on his face, and we don't know why any of this happened, but he's a real mess right now. Yeah. They they do like um, mention that he's also connected with some crimes, so, you know, we gotta keep keep an eye on him, and we gotta question him, and stuff like that, but yeah, it's it's a very interesting way to open it, where it kind of keeps you like on, on your edge of your seat a little bit, like what's going on here, 
and it's like you get that brief opening and then it takes an hour for the film to get back to that point and like catch up yeah uh, at which point the whole scene's been recontextualized mm -hmm. so that in theory if you've never seen any of if you haven't seen let the right one in you're watching let me in for the first time you're like who is this monster that has been killing people that has been burned and now is in this hospital bed yeah and you have elias codius mm -hmm. who is an actor i dearly love i love elias codius in, in movies this might be my favorite performance of his it's up there it's yeah it, it's very subtle Mm -hmm. He has very little dialogue in the grand scheme of things, but he is just, he captures that kind of melancholy presence that the whole movie has. Like, the movie has a real, you know, I just listened to a couple of Smith songs kind of vibe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Elias Kodis, uh, he he looks... He is a dead ringer in this film for one of my high school English teachers, but with just a slightly less hair. Um, and goddamn, I, uh, this, through this whole thing, I'm like, Mr. Hansen, is that you? What are you? Why are you a detective now? What's going on? Uh, <laughs> so I was instantly rooting for him because he, he looks just like my favorite English teacher from back in high school. So yeah, he's very soft spoken in this movie. Mm -hmm. He's very quiet. He's got a really good bushy '80s mustache yep. and that kind of pulled back hair that's kind of long. It, yeah. It's a good look for Elias Cody's. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so he asked to speak to this patient they're like look this guy ain't saying nothing because uh he went he inhaled this acid as well as poured it on himself so his vocal cords are just fucked and so are his lungs like we've got mm -hmm. him on a respirator and the whole deal and he's like yeah yeah yeah, but i need to talk to this guy and this is where we get a, a touch of that satanic panic thing where he <laughs> elias codius is like hey i need to know who you are before you die were you part of some satanic cult what what happened here mm -hmm. um and then it turns out uh like the nurse is distracted by this young girl coming in to ask about like her father yeah and uh the nurse is like well you know uh, i'm sorry but your father's kind of fucked and then a few seconds later this guy goes plummeting out the window and boy does that nurse have the worst week of her fucking life right like Ugh. first first this and then later on what happens to her <laughs> yeah God. oh man you're right like if, if this wasn't bad enough Mm -hmm. um yeah but i suppose i the upside is she only has to live with this trauma for so long yeah i guess <laughs> so always you know i'll look for the silver lining yeah you know yeah. but uh when when they find out that eliza uh, or that richard jenkins has done a nosedive out his window onto the ground below um they find a note that he's left that says i'm sorry abby and then we cut two weeks prior yep. and we meet Owen, uh, who's played by Cody Smith Mc McPhee, who is a British actor, which blows my mind that mm. a kid this young is this good and is also doing an American accent. Yeah, he, he does. He does do it amazing i have i can't remember if i've actually even seen him in anything else since since this but uh he is amazing in this like he, he does a really good job he's also really scary in this in a way because he's he's a very troubled boy like very troubled boy uh like when we first see him basically he's he's uh stabbing with a knife while wearing a translucent mask and then he's doing his uh constant voyeurism that he seems to have a uh, uh, a, a little bit of a hobby uh, <laughs> are focused around. Yeah, yeah. He, all right, so just a quick catch up with uh, Cody Smith McPhee. Um, since doing this, he was, of course, in the road right before this. Oh, that's right, yeah. Uh, but has since been in uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. So Matt okay. Reeves brought him back for that. And he was Nightcrawler in the new X Men movie. All right, yeah, I've, 
I try, I try to forget the newer X Men movies as much you're, as I can. You're not wrong. You're <laughs> not wrong. Um, but yeah, I mean, super talented guy for sure. And mm-hmm. um, but yeah, he <laughs> when when we first see him, he's singing the now and later song. Which mm-hmm. will come into play again in the film. But yeah, and it, it's a thing where he is obviously very troubled. Uh, like you said, he's kind of spying rear window style mm-hmm. on the, his neighbors who are a couple that definitely likes to fuck and doesn't close the blinds. And yeah. And the woman seems to kind of be aware of it a little bit. Yeah, she's uh, like, what's that creepy kid doing over there? <laughs> yeah she definitely has a reaction to it and it's and it's not entirely negative it's sort of like well i'm sure he's got a natural curiosity but also knock it off weirdo yeah yeah and her his parents are in the midst of a divorce Mm -hmm. and one thing that matt reeves does in this movie that i really like is the parents and a lot of the adults in fact are just constantly out of focus yeah Um, you don't you don't even get like I don't think you even get like a clear shot of his mother's face throughout the whole movie if I'm if I'm not mistaken like she's she's present but she's very much like uh you know a, a, a grown up in a in a peanuts cartoon you know she's just kind of in the periphery all the time yeah there's one long shot where she's in focus but it's just enough distance that you still can like you couldn't pick her out of a lineup right from watching this movie but um yeah and so we get the impression that you know he's a lonely kid uh his parents going through this divorce has kind of sidelined him in the family like he's just not given a whole lot of attention yeah and the while he's doing his rear window shtick he sees uh his new neighbors moving in which is the the father richard jenkins and Abby, as played mm-hmm. by uh, Chloe Grace Moretz, um, yep. who are... The, like, when he first sees her, the thing that he notices is she is walking through the snow and she's not wearing shoes. Yeah. Which she was actually doing in real snow when they were filming this. They had, they had to, like... Every time they cut a, a take, they are like, okay, get her off the snow real quick. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it sure sounds like she... Like, it doesn't sound like Matt Reeves was just a, a slave driver or anything on this film, yeah. uh, based on the commentary, but it, he was very complimentary of her kind of being a trooper for all these really cold scenes, because even when they were shooting on a set, it was still really cold. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, so he gets a glimpse of her... And we get the uh, the sense that there's definitely something unusual about her. Yeah. And then we uh, see him in school where he is being just brutally bullied Ugh. by Kenny, Mark, and Donald. Yeah, and like this, the, bully, the bullying in, in this film, like the intensity of it definitely gave me some anxiety uh, in this rewatch it's like i was i've i've had people attempt to bully me uh, i tended to fight back even if i lost the fight kind of thing but so i've never had it like this bad and this by god oh and he gets it bad he gets it super bad yeah the first real incident that we see is them giving him um, a wedgie that causes him oh. to to piss himself yeah and and there's all like when we first meet him he's doing the like are you you a little girl kind of thing and Mm -hmm. but this is where we see the bullies calling him a little girl yeah and and understand that like oh that's where this kid's psychology is is you know this is how he's being referred to and then after after he pisses himself in school, when we see him again that night, he's outside with this knife, uh, stabbing a tree, kind of mm-hmm. basically role playing like, oh, if I get bullied again, I'm gonna stab these bitches. Yeah, yeah, he's he's, he's trying to work himself up to it. Like, uh, it almost feels like who knows if 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 Abby hadn't come into his life, whether he would actually have ever decided to actually defend himself 
Um, but he's he's certainly letting letting out a lot of like stress and anxiety and stuff by doing this. Like he's just out there, like trying to work this all out of his head. Yeah, like there is a world in which he just becomes a school shooter in a Lars von Trier film. Oh yeah, yeah you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's he's definitely troubled. And then when he turns around, there is Abby still not wearing shoes, mm-hmm. and they chit chat a little bit. But she's very standoffish with him and says like, "Hey, we can't be friends." Just yeah. to put that out on Front Street, we are not going to be pals. Like, I think that's the first thing she says to him, <laughs> pretty yeah. much. It's like, oh, well, nice to meet you as well, weird shoeless girl on the monkey bars. Okay. <laughs> You're right. And she, she um, he also tells her that she smells weird. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, th- again, there's clearly something off about her because... You know, she's this girl not wearing a coat out in the middle of the freezing cold with no shoes on. And and that ain't right. Um, mm-hmm. And then we also see her father, Richard Jenkins, or the who we assume is her father uh, at this point in the film. Uh, kind of keeping an eye on her, a, a very watchful uh, gaze upon this girl. And uh, then it turns out uh, we get to see what... Uh, Richard Jenkins actually does for her, mm-hmm. which is to, he's got a method, which I really like, mm-hmm. w- which is he finds, uh, like an, an open car in a parking lot and then puts this plastic bag over his head, which, uh, it turns out like this was, I, you probably listened to the same commentary I did, but, uh, Richard Jenkins came up with this, with the mm-hmm. bag and, <laughs> Uh, and I really like uh, the Matt Reeves story where he was like, yeah, Richard Jenkins came up with this this plastic bag over the head thing, and we went with it, and then the day we went to shoot it, he looked at me and was like, is this silly? Do I look a little silly right now? <laughs> and he was like, no, you look scary as shit. <laughs> like, in the- yeah, no, he does. Like, it really, it really taps into, you know, how serial killers were really becoming a, a cultural kind of phenomenon and, and a real boogeyman in, in especially in North America at this point in time where, you know, right out of the seventies into the eighties, we were hearing a lot more about these people. Like, you know, the, the FBI were actually finally starting to get like profiles on these people and making it known that, you know, we know what to look for with these people. And, and so he's he's really echoing like Zodiac Killer in some in in, in the sort of do it yourself uh, sort of aspect of what he does, uh, you know, just making a mask out of a plastic bag. He's got a bottle of sulfuric acid, uh, probably to you know get rid of evidence, but it comes in handy when he has to destroy his facial features with it. Um, and you know he's he's just really sort of just really risking it too like he's really putting himself out there to like get these victims it's not an easy job and uh it just made me think of there's a hidden like really awesome serial killer film in this film with uh elias uh codius uh friggin like hunting him down like i, I kind of want to see that movie too uh, <laughs> because it looks really good like it looks like a really good uh like uh, riff on Zodiac or yeah. something like that. Cause this film looks a lot like Zodiac too, in a lot of ways. So it, yeah, it's beautifully shot. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're right. Like uh, there is this subplot of, you know, Cody is chasing this killer in the movie. It's just that the front story or the, the a story of the movie is this relationship between Abby and Owen. But yeah, in yeah. the background, also, there's kind of an interesting story with the couple across the way and what's going on with them and mm-hmm. and also what's going on with the bully at home. Like, there's a lot of texture to this movie where it doesn't go out of its way to tell you these B-plots, but they're all there and they're all kind of interesting threads to pick at. Yeah, and... Pardon oh, me. What a piece of shit. Okay, <laughs> um... <laughs> Uh, that's what you get living in a rural town. Um, friggin', uh, I like, so, like, a lot of the movie is actually more from Owen's perspective, and I kind of like how, you know, he's a really isolated, lonely kid, so 
you only pick up like the, the sort of edges of other people's lives when, when you're that detached from everybody. So like the film kind of gives you that sense that you're just picking up the edges of these different characters' lives. And these are all like characters for the most part that Owen has spied upon with his uh, telescope. And then a lot of them end up dying when uh, pretty much everyone he puts his telescope on dies in this film, I think. Yeah. Uh, so it's really, it's really kind of interesting that for a lot of the movie, it does kind of put you in his world, his perspective through his eyes. Um, and I, I feel like it reflects that where, where you only get, you know, the, the scant little, like, what do you really know about a person? Like if this quiet detective comes up to you, all you know is that he's a quiet detective. Like, what else do you know about him? And the movie kind of reflects that a little bit, I think. Yeah, it, it's it, yeah, it, it's very good. And then you get into his method of killing. Not only does he lie in the back seat of their their car, he waits till they're kind of away from civilization. Yeah. In in the first case. A, uh, stopping at a railroad crossing and then he pops out of the back seat chloroforms them then drives them out to the middle of nowhere strings them up and then you know knife to the jugular mm. and then he he captures using a big funnel and jug captures all of that blood but right from jump he fucks up yeah like he's over the hill like he he is He's not one of these, um, I kind of really appreciate this, like he, he's, he's definitely in the long tradition of sort of the vampire's familiar, the human familiar, and usually in classical vampire sort of lore, if you have a human familiar, they're granted something by the vampire, like they're either promised like immortality at some point, or they're granted like special powers, like you, you get like James Mason and Salem's Lot, you know, you know, the master. You know, back shaman back and he's got like extraordinary strength and you can shoot him a couple times and he'll survive kind of thing not here uh, richard jenkins is an old man who's been doing this way too long yeah there there's a great scene later on where he's talking about how much he's fucked up mm -hmm. and uh and he says like maybe i'm just too old maybe i'm just tired yeah you know that he's been living it we'll get into it but yeah the, this life that he's led has to be incredibly frustrating and difficult and um unfulfilling in a lot of ways and mm -hmm. i mean it's just a very sad life that he has chosen for himself but also didn't know any better at the time yeah. he made the choice so yeah i think that's different from and I think that's different from the circumstance in the original film, right? Like, there, he's a much darker, different character in the original film, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. He's like, I think in the, even at least in the text of the novel that this is based on, he's straight up a pedophile. He, uh, I, I haven't read the book, so I don't, I, I can't speak to that. In the film, there is the implication that he has... Or in the the original Swedish film, there's certainly an implication that he has the these jealousies surrounding, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ellie and Oscar in in that film. But I don't I I don't know that I I think it's more an implication of he was, you know, uh, Oscar 1.0 or however yeah, yeah. many there have been. That's that's definitely what the film shows. Uh, I was doing a lot of reading on this. So I was starting to get things confused because you got two films and you got the source material. And then there was like a sequel made down the road, wrote, written down the road by the same uh, guy. And it's like, yeah, I, I think, I think the original source material he's and possibly in the, in the original film, he's supposed to be kind of like, he, he wasn't necessarily recruited as a kid. He yeah. kind of, he kind of did this because, Oh, I have a play thing. Which is, ugh. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it it's not that creepy in the film, in the Swedish yeah. film, but there's definitely a, a lot of question marks surrounding their relationship. Other than he does seem to have a genuine affection for her, yeah, that yeah. isn't purely a sexual, you know, kind of fetishism. Yeah. Um, the book, I do believe, there is a much darker kind of undertone to all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, just like in 
this film, there's there's a little bit uh, less darkness surrounding Abby herself. Yeah, it's much more. It's much. I don't want to say sanitized, but it, it's streamlined, and it's more. I, even though it's beat for beat, pretty much with with the, with the Swedish film, it, it is kind of streamlined and made a little bit easier to uh, take on the palette. Uh, yeah, it, it's not quite as dark. Yeah, like in the original book, I think the idea is that when Ellie is attacked originally and becomes a vampire, mm-hmm. that he at the time he is so mutilated that that's why he's ultimately castrated and when you see in the film that is a nod to this storyline in the book yeah um and in this movie it's just like no 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 she's just a girl yeah even though they're they play with that a little bit with the dialogue about well i'm not really a girl but that's more about her the the nature of the kind of creature she is as opposed to yeah the actual gender it's it's her it's her psychology not you know Yeah. yeah but uh, so, uh, anyway, Rich Jenkins fucks all this up, goes home, Abby yells at him in her uh, crazy vampire voice, mm-hmm. and Oscar, not Oscar, uh, Owen hears this and thinks that it's the father yelling at her. Yeah. And so when they run into each other again, when Abby and Owen run into each other again out in the courtyard, um, <laughs> he's like, hey, why aren't you wearing shoes? Also... Why is your stomach growling so much? And why do you smell that way? <laughs> and it starts really digging into her. Meanwhile, she's kind of fascinated by the Rubik's Cube that he has. Mm-hmm. And Owen leaves it for her. He's like, yeah, well, you can play with it. I got to go inside because uh, mom's calling. And Abby's like, well, I'm going to stay here because I've got to go murder and get blood. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, she does, and probably, I, I really like the sequence up until the CGI, and I, I yes. do, that stuff is really frustrating to me in this movie, because so much of it is great, and mm-hmm. then, uh, so, what she does, she hides in a tunnel, yeah. and when this dude comes jogging by, he's like, hey little girl, uh, are, do you live around here? And she's like, yes, I'm cold, can you carry me? And so he picks her up, and then CGI happens as she flips all over the tunnel. And they didn't need to do that. Like it could have, it could have been like point of view shot of the jogger looking down at the girl. She looks up, makes scary vampire face. Cut to her on top of him, just biting down into him. It didn't need to be this frantic, uh, you know, leaping monkey show where she's like jumping all over him and, and smashing him against the tunnel and stuff. It's like I understand kind of why you did it because you wanted to put some action in this very slow film. But they didn't need to do it. Yeah, I wonder at times if that wasn't just a studio note of like, hey, this Feels. is a this is a monster movie and we need monsters in it. Yeah. Um but yeah, it's it's kind of a bummer because I think I think you're right. I think if they had taken the approach of like this is going to be just as you know, modestly paced as the rest of the movie, it would have been way more frightening. Mm-hmm. Even because when you see her jumping around, it's like, oh, well, that's just <laughs> yeah, this crazy vampire monkey is not scary. Yeah, it, it, it might as well be one of the, the freaking vampires from uh, the Will Smith uh, I Am Legend or whatever. You know, it's just like, why are you doing this? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but anyway, she is now fed and has killed this dude. And she tells Richard Jenkins about it and he's pissed about it. Because he has to go clean up this mess now. Yeah. And so he dumps the body into this nearby lake. And so Owen then, the next day, he discovers the Rubik's Cube, which is now solved. And when he comes home that evening, there's Abby waiting for him. And she's cleaned up a bunch. Mm Mm-hmm. And is like, hey, I don't smell as bad now, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, how did you solve this Rubik's Cube thing again? And she's like, yeah, yeah, I'm just good at puzzles. Yeah. By the way, did you notice I washed my hair? Now I'm wearing boots. How about that? Right. Like, I'm a, I'm a people like you. Yeah. I'm, I, <laughs> I'm you know, human bartender, Jackie Daytona. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, and we get some glimpses into Abby's 
very sad life as well. Like, she doesn't know her birthday. She doesn't celebrate a birthday. She doesn't get any presents. And so he gives her the Rubik's Cube as a gift. Mm -hmm. And then we, we get the sense that he's starting to kind of have these feelings for her. This, you know, young love, burgeoning young love. And as if to reinforce that, the next day at school, they're watching Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, and take take this back to my uh, English teacher, Mr. Hanson, that I talked about. He showed us that the Olivia Hussey, uh, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. Um, and he showed us the unedited version. So, you know, uh, thank you, Mr. Hanson. <laughs> right. Yeah, I th the same way. I remember seeing that in middle school i guess is where we saw the mm. the zeffirelli maybe it was high school the the zeffirelli romeo and juliet it was like oh my god those are boobies mm -hmm. um <laughs> yeah they but, just had coitus what's going on right we're watching movies where people fuck in school <laughs> <laughs> but rather than pay attention to romeo and juliet owen is working out morse code yeah and one of the kids, Kenny, sees him jotting all this stuff down. And I like the, the Matt Reeve, uh, Reeves explanation of this, of like, he sees this kid and he just can't allow Owen any joy at all. Right. And so when Owen is in the bathroom, the kids show up and they're like, hey, what, what were you working on in class? And when he, Owen isn't very forthcoming about it they take a car antenna and just start <laughs> whipping him with it creating um this gash on his cheek and they're like hey listen kid you are not go you're gonna tell people you fell down at recess and not that we did this to you which is exactly what he tells his mother later yeah um but yeah it's another one of those like oh this kid is not gonna grow up right no it's it's real it's it's pretty fucking hard to watch like it it it, is, it doesn't doesn't restrain itself at all with the bullying it's it's very on point like oh man this has happened to so many people and it's just gross yeah yeah and so he meets abby again later and he confesses to her like she sees the band-aid and he kind of confesses that he's being bullied and she's like listen if they do this again, you need to hit them back. And you need to hit them back hard, as hard as you can. And then they'll stop. And if they don't stop, you let me know and I can help you. Yeah. And as a viewer, you're like, oh, shit, kid. You should probably end this right now. Because mm -hmm. uh, you can probably escape with your life and you won't be the... the uh, inciting incident for a bunch of murder later but <laughs> that's not how the movie goes and no. <laughs> so instead he he gives her the morse code uh stuff that he copied and so there's a great moment where they they go back to their apartments and abby walks in richard jenkins is in this shitty like one bedroom with a mattress on the floor and just live in the worst possible life. And <laughs> his, only joy, his only joy in life is like the Walkman he's listening to. Whatever he's listening to, like whatever pop song he's listening to on it. Yeah, and she's like, get out. I need mm -hmm. a, I need that wall. And he's like, oh, God. All right, Abby. Yeah. He's, oh, he's such a... He, like, he's pathetic, but also... Again, you Once you sort of understand what's going on here, which is that he is not just her familiar, but clearly is uh a dude who loves her and mm -hmm. and has for years but he's emotionally stunted because he is forever in love with a 12 year old yeah and it's like you know physically incapable of you know physically having that love it's it's just purely companionship and nothing else and providing for her but not mm -hmm. you know what do you get out of that you know yeah and like he's like obviously he's, he's a grown man in his 50s but there's no way he could have progressed like emotionally outside of really being that that same kid that got sucked into this whole thing 
So he, he it's very, very basic, very sad relationship in, in a lot of ways. It's just you just kind of look at the guy like, oh fuck, man, like you just had no chance. Right? Yeah. As soon as you hooked up with Abby, you were you were done. Yeah. And and it's understandable because you know when you see the picture of them from years before you're like oh yeah i get it like you were this you know pathetic looking kind of nerdy kid Mm -hmm. and here's this you know when you're 12 years old this beautiful girl but then the older you get and she stays the same age that relationship has no choice but to change yeah and but you're also completely incapable of like by that point you're a murderer and you're, Mm -hmm. you're you're bonded to this creature in a way that is fundamental to who you are. And it may, it may, yeah, it made me even wonder, like, could he be a virgin even? Like, at, even mm. at that point, like, still, you know, like, it has never had sex? Very yeah. possibly. I mean, yeah. I mean, clearly, I say clearly, I mean, the, I, the idea that he ever had sex with Abby seems pretty yeah pretty ne- negligible like yeah that seems far-fetched but also how on earth would he have a relationship even a short one with anyone yeah oh god it, it's <laughs> the more you dig into <laughs> to that the sadder it gets yeah it just makes me think man my life's pretty good <laughs> yeah no yeah no matter what you got going on you're better than richard jenkins and let me in that's for sure mm-hmm. but uh yeah so he oh and then Signs up for the uh, a weightlifting class after school. Oh, I love I love this little bit character here, uh, Mister Zorik. Yeah. As soon as I saw him on screen, I was like, "Pay that man his money." It's just <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, give me more of this guy. <laughs> yeah, he's he's not in it very much, but he's actually a decent guy to Owen, and maybe is mm-hmm. the only decent guy to Owen. Yeah, he's he's. Like, you know, in a different movie, he's the father figure that Owen doesn't have in his life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in a world without Abby, mm-hmm. he, he could have been sort of Owen's savior to some degree. Yeah. Um, or just the guy who discovered his body. But, you know, we'll see. <laughs> 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 but, and, and then Owen and Abby uh, go on a date where... Uh, Owen lifts a little money out of his mother's purse to take mm-hmm. Abby to the arcade, uh, where he has the same experience with Miss Pac-Man that I do, uh, <laughs> which is to play for about ninety seconds, die, and be like, "Man, this this game sucks. This fucking sucks." Yeah, let's let's not do this ever again. <laughs> right. Um, and he tries to get her to eat a now and later, and she's like, "Uh." I don't think that's a great idea. And he's like, no, they're good. Really, try one. And finally she relents. Yeah. And so has one and cut to her immediately throwing up outside this place. Yeah. And when, after she gets sick, and there's this really sweet scene where um, he hugs her. And this is the first time that she says, like, well, would you like me if I wasn't a girl? And he's like, yeah, I guess I would. Yeah. And um, she's like, okay, then. And while all this is going on in the background, like Richard Jenkins is getting increasingly jealous of this new relationship. And in the scene, there's like one really emotional scene between them. Yeah. Where she like reaches up and touches his cheek, and he just looks at her with this like puppy dog love, and yeah, but he begs, he begs her right, like please don't see that boy again. Right? Yeah. Like you're replacing. I can see that you're replacing me. Yeah. And um, you know, it it again, it kind of begs the question of like, what are Abby's motivations here? Is yeah. this really her trying to replace him? Or is ju- this just that, oh, well, this guy or this boy that she also cared about has now turned into this old man and she's still 12 years old and wants to be with other 12 year olds. Yeah. And I, f- I feel like this movie, it eases off. Like, I, th- I think the original makes it a bit more clear that 
yeah, she's very manipulative and she's knowingly manipulative uh, of, of people. Um, even if, even if, she, you know, uh, she does care, um, she still has this need for self-preservation and, and I think there's still a little bit of that in this film, but in this film, I feel like it definitely tries to go for, oh no, there, there actually is like a real legit love story here and the relationship is much more pure and honest in, in a lot more ways and but I mean there's still that instinct in her there's still that need to survive there's still a, an uncontrollable kind of thing within her that is kind of forcing her to do this even if her intentions are a bit better uh, when it comes to Owen here um, where you know she's actually She's not just manipulating him. She's actually trying, you know, to get this relationship going. She's actually, like, trying for Owen. Like, you know, she cleans herself up. She wears boots and stuff like that. Like, it, it, it doesn't feel sinister or malevolent um, when she's doing those things, to me, anyway. Like, I feel like this movie tries to... Uh, it's You know, it's much more of a nice love story, even though there's still tragedy underneath it. Like, there's still... You know, in the end, Owen's still going to end up like Richard Jenkins, probably. But it, it's trying to, you know, it, it's for the North American audience. You know, we're babies. Let's let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, but I think you're right, though. Like, even if she has the best of in intentions, the end result is the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is the tragedy of the whole story. And maybe even more tragic if she really does care about him and isn't just manipulated. But all right, so let's catch up to the beginning of the movie <laughs> because after this great scene with Richard Jenkins and Chloe Grace Moretz, uh, where they kind of have this moment where he asks her, pleads with her not to see him anymore. And also admits that he's exhausted by all the murder. Yeah. Uh, he goes out to do that though. He goes out to, to fetch more blood for her and where, before he kicked the jug over uh which was unfortunate this time around yeah he it, fucks up it, yeah it's it's just he's a victim of circumstance to some degree yeah. and and it, again in the commentary Matt Reeves made a really good point where it's strange that you start to sympathize with this serial killer oh you yeah it's in the like, back seat where you're like oh no you fucked up so bad oh no <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, it puts you right in this place, like, because you get some per 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 perspective shots uh, from him, where he's laying down in in the in the seat um, and looking up at the lights going by in the car. So it's like immediately puts you in into into his head and his perspective, and it's like, oh fuck, we are fucked. This guy, we we thought we were getting this lone kid in this car, but now there's two of them, and now they're going to the gas station. The chances of me being discovered are just like tenfold more now, and it's like I gotta fucking move. And, well, yeah, probably the play would have been like, let me try to get this kid unconscious and then book it, mm -hmm. and 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 fuck like securing blood for tonight. Let's try this again tomorrow. But but instead, what happens is he kind of struggles with this dude in a car. Um, he finally gets the kid knocked out and gets in the driver's seat, but now there are other cars as well as the owner of the car in pursuit of him. Yeah. And he ends up going over an embankment and you get this great shot of inside the car as it tumbles over and over. Yeah. And, and fucks him up real good. And he lands, you know, at the bottom of this gully or whatever. Mm -hmm. And is like, Oh, I'm fucked. So I'm about to get caught. I'm busted up real good. I'm just going to whip out this acid and pour it over my head. And that's going to kill me. Except yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. And it's like, it's going to kill me and it's going to protect uh, Abby at the same time. Because, right. Because uh, they won't be able to trace who I am or whatever, or they will make it super hard and she'll have time to get out of town kind of thing. But that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. So he pours the acid on his face, doesn't kill him. The ambulance shows up 
and like I said, we're at the beginning of the movie again, where he's brought in Elias Codius is there uh, to try to question him to figure out like, hey, are you, did you also kill this other person? Mm-hmm. And except we see sort of what happens before he hits the ground, which is that Abby shows up outside his window. Yeah. And asks to be let in the old vampire trope of you have to be invited in for a vampire mm-hmm. to come in. And he has this kind of heartbreaking thing where he like points at his mouth and shakes his head because he can't speak. Yeah. So he can not invite her in. So what he does is he just leans his head out and sacrifices himself one final time for Abby to allow her to feed. And then he goes out the window. Oh man, and he looks like Dr. Fibes. <laughs> yeah, he is. I'll tell you, one of the when I was watching this, one of the things I was really impressed by was how they got the teeth looking right in the prosthetic. Mm-hmm. It looks like his jaw or his his cheek is just totally eaten away. Yeah, yeah, like sometimes when you when you see those sort of like oh the face is rotted kind of thing it's like the prosthetics and stuff they have to put on makes the head unnaturally large and it just looks out of proportion but they did a really great job on him here like he he just looks legit legit like oh yeah he burned his face like beyond third degree with acid like he's he's done (laughs) and there's another great matt reeve story here where he talks about how he cast richard jenkins pursued him because he thought he had these great soulful eyes and when they came to do the prosthetic um it called for like one of the eyes to be really milky and and Mm -hmm. whited out and he was like no 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 you can't do that because richard jenkins has these great eyes and it was richard jenkins who was like no 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 i can still act with this eye so Mm -hmm. yeah go ahead and do the other one (laughs) and and to his credit man when i was i watched this twice for this show and on that second watch the the look that he gives her from that one good eye as he you know tilts his head and bends down toward her is again it's just the most sad sorrowful look yeah of like i wish it didn't end this way but i'm glad that in in a way it's like i'm glad it's you you Mm -hmm. know i'm glad i can do this one last thing and so yeah so abby drinks blood from him he goes out the window And then Abby shows up at Owen's window afterwards and asks to be let inside. And he's like, he's asleep. I like that they play this scene much like the original where he's just like, yeah, fine, I guess. I'm asleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so she comes in and takes off her clothes and slips into bed. And there's the conversation that uh, we had in, in, again, in the original where... Um, he asks her to go steady and she's like eh can't we just keep everything like it is and she's like well wait a second what does it mean if we go steady is it just like this and he's like yeah (laughs) yeah yeah basically it's this and she's like oh okay then we can go steady yeah yeah and then she leaves him uh late that night he wakes up in the morning alone only with a note which is a quote from romeo and juliet uh, that says, I must be gone and live or stay and die. Mm-hmm. And so then uh, th- let's do the pond scene. Yeah. Where on a field trip, um, Owen is once again confronted by his bullies. And he has this like metal pole. That- yeah, it's it was like st- stuck in the ground. Like, I, I guess it's like a here's a pond you should probably not walk onto it or kind of thing you know like yeah and they're like what are you gonna do with that little girl and Mm -hmm. he's like if you mess with me i'm gonna hit you as hard as i can with it yeah and they continue messing with him and this is a real like fuck around and find out situation Mm -hmm. uh because kenny fucks around and finds out i love that i love that mr zorik like sees this going down and he doesn't intervene until after Owen hits <laughs> Kenny, he's kind of like looking like, oh yeah, let's see if uh, let's see if Owen finally you know stands up to these assholes kind of thing. And then when he finally does, he's like, okay, now I got to pretend to be an adult. I'll come over there and try to break this up. But <laughs> he gets distracted from that real quick. Yeah, well, because they found the body of mm-hmm. 
the the dude that Abby killed in the tunnel, who is yeah. uh, and it's an effect borrowed from the original film, but it still totally works. Uh, which is they cut this, you know, circle of ice out of the pond, and the dude is half frozen in it. Yeah, it's got the real Han Solo and the carbonite shit going yeah. on. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, as he was going into the drink, Richard Jenkins said, I love you. And he said, I know. And then <laughs> dropped him in. But um, so then we uh, we have a scene that is more borrowed from the book than the original movie, where Owen takes her to this room inside the apartment building that is sort of decorated for teenagers and apparently in the book, which I haven't read, but you know, here's second hand, um, mm -hmm. that there, the, there is a character of like the local handyman who is a teenager that still is around and hangs out in this room. And it's sort of like one of the, the characters that Oscar in the book kind of looks up to and emulates to some degree. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this one, the handyman is gone. It's just that Owen still knows about it. And Abby's like, well, why did you bring me down here? And he's like, well, I wanted us to be closer. And I figured out the best way to do that would be for us to essentially share blood. Like blood brothers. Like, yeah, I, I, again, being a child of the 80s, I remember that shit well. Of mm -hmm. Being blood brothers was kind of a big deal. And yeah he cuts his thumb and of course abby is a vampire <laughs> yeah <laughs> and sees blood and starts like licking it off the floor and uh another thing that this movie does that is uh somewhat different from the original is that she definitely gets vampiric as yeah. she slurps up the blood from the floor and is like you you need to get out of here and yeah when he doesn't leave then she runs off but n now she's in full vampire mode yep it's like oh, gotta eat again <laughs> right like, like now i got a taste for it you know it's like if somebody gives you just a little bit of general so's <laughs> and you're like well i can't stop there i gotta be another egg roll i gotta i gotta start <laughs> dropping this shit yeah so she ends up attacking the woman that Owen was looking at through the telescope and uh, the boyfriend chases her off but not before she you know gets a fair amount of blood and, and gets a good bite out of her yeah and um, the very next day this woman whose name is Virginia um, is at the hospital and is like hey you know the the nurse is saying like oh we dumped like six pints of blood in her she can't seem to get enough <laughs> and she wakes up and just starts chewing on her arm to yeah. feed her herself her own blood um hmm, I, I guess technically probably feeding on someone else's blood that's been pumped into her which in a weird way does that make sense i don't no, yeah, I yeah, I think so. I mean, it's she has to drink blood and this is the only blood she's got. Mhm. Mm and then the nurse kicks open the curtains and then she catches fire and the nurse tries to stop it and the nurse yeah. catches fire too. Yeah, and it's like, well, there's the end of your bad week, lady. Holy fuck. Oh man. Uh uh poor poor gal. Yeah. And Okay, but now Owen has gotten wise to what's going on with Abby and shows up at her apartment and is like, hey, are you a vampire? <laughs> and she she doesn't say yes. She just says, I need blood to live. And, yeah. and, and then we get maybe one of the classic lines from either version of the movie or both versions of the movie, which is him asking her, how old are you? And she says 12, but I've been 12 for a very long time. Yeah. And uh, he asks about her dad. And she's like, that wasn't really my dad. Also, he's kind of... <laughs> he's out of the picture now. Mm -hmm. And anyway, Owen is like, okay, well, I'm going to go home then. If that's okay, are you going to try to stop me? And it's kind of testing her of like, are we 
are we cool or yeah <laughs> did you like what you tasted earlier am i gonna have a problem here um but it turns out that they are cool uh, yeah. Abby shows up and asks to be invited into his place, and he doesn't uh, invite her in, and she comes in anyway. And then she starts to bleed from her, like, just every orifice, her eyes, her skin starts bleeding. Mm -hmm. And then Owen, seeing what's going on, very quickly says, no, no, you can come in, you can come in. And... That that feels like a mistake because he already invited her in with yeah into his bedroom yeah yeah i was like what what are the uh what are the boundaries here is like his personal bedroom is that a separate space from the house i guess <laughs> okay yeah if you go through the front door is it different i don't know i don't yeah. know yeah it's uh, uh, you're right that is a, a little bit of a question mark vampires let us know what the rules are please yes please write in Bo at legionpodcasts.com uh, please drop me a line let me know what the rules of being uh, invited in are um, and so because her current outfit is really bloody Owen is like well you can take a shower and also take one of my mom's dresses and then the mother comes home which causes Abby to have to flee out his bedroom window and into mm. her apartment where they kind of look at each other out the window and giggle of like, hey, hey you're a vampire. I know. He, he. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, Owen ends up finding a note from her saying, hey, you want to hang out tonight? And uh, he's like, hey, I got myself a girlfriend. This is great. Yep. But then uh, our, our, you know, sort of chickens come home to roost as the detective has been hot on the heels of what's going on with his father, uh, ends up tracking uh, Abby down to her apartment yep. and uh, br busts in. Um, Owen is there kind of hiding and uh, Elias Codius goes to the bathroom where he finally finds Abby in there under a bunch of blankets in the bathtub which is a really cool visual i, I like that mm -hmm. it's a real rudimentary kind of coffin but i think yeah. it works and he starts to you know peel away the uh all the newspaper and cardboard covering the window and she burns in the sunlight um doesn't catch fire the way that uh our poor virginia did because it's only a little bit of sunlight but then Owen screams no, yep. which al distracts Elias Codius long enough for Abby to jump on him and do the vampire monkey bit again. Yeah. And, and probably the best moment of this whole sequence is as he is being fed upon, Elias Codius like, reaches for Owen for help. And Owen starts to reach his hand out, and it, it looks as if he's going to help, but then he just closes the bathroom door to let Abby do her Yeah, thing. he makes his decision. He's like, nope, I'm, I'm on Team Abby. This is what we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, yeah you're right. That is the point where he, he becomes Team Abby. And uh, then after all this goes down, Abby's like, I gotta go. I can't, like, <laughs> I gotta bail. It's like when a grift goes bad. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I gotta get out of town. Yeah. <laughs> and so he sees her, like, in a uh, taxi taken off, and he ends up going to his weight class, which ends up being in the pool that day, mm -hmm. where Mr. Zorik is, uh, you know, teaching him, uh, basically it's just swimming, kicking his legs, getting his, his muscles up to something. Cause he's a scrawny little whisper of a lad. Yeah. After swim class, I teach you how to play poker. <laughs> I, you go get me Oreos. Then yeah, get me Oreos. <laughs> I like Oreo and milk while I play poker. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, but as, uh, he's 
getting ready for uh, the lesson. They they uh, the bullies are there. They end up starting a fire in a dumpster and are like, "Hey, Mister Zorik, uh, there's a whole uh, you know fire going on outside." And he's like, "Okay, everybody, wait here. I'm going to yeah. go check dumpster." And yeah, and the the key to this is that it's not just the bullies; it's the big brother of Kenny, who we learn was also doing pretty much the same kind of bullying to Kenny, and that's why it's kind of passed down to uh, Owen as well. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Like he even call the older brother even calls him a little girl, and so yeah, yeah. It's a very direct. This kid is getting bullied at home, and so he bullies the kids at school. And there's a really harrowing moment where Owen run like gets out of the pool and runs to the locker room, and mm-hmm. these kids drag him by the leg, screaming back into the pool. Oh, it's bad. Yeah, it's it's rough. And but they get him in there, and again, this is the end of the original as well, the original film as well. Of the brother says, "Okay, here's the deal. I'm gonna hold you underwater for three minutes." If you make it, I'm only going to scratch your cheek. If you come up early, I'm going to poke your eye out with this knife. Mm. And so under the water, Owen goes. And then we get glimpses of all hell breaking loose above the water. Yeah. And and when, by the time like a head falls into the water and all that stuff. It's cool. that This whole scene is very good. Mm-hmm. And they don't and like in this one they don't uh Abby doesn't spare anybody. She she spared someone in the original. Uh but in this one they don't she doesn't spare anyone. She kills all the bullies. Like just yeah. murderizes them. Yeah. Yeah, and they and uh again this is kind of the the Matt Reeves commentary bit, but uh he points out like, "Oh, if you listen to this, you can hear everything happening above the water. Like you can hear the first per the, the first kid get got the brother yell out and then you can hear abby moving around the room if you've got like a 5.1 system mm-hmm. and and that kind of thing it's very cool like the sound design of this is really really good the the kid going head first in the water just you know <laughs> flying yeah. through the water is really good as well and yeah she kills everybody yeah and and then uh, she, he, you know Owen climbs out of the the water. There's Abby's bloody feet, and he looks up at her, and you know she's his savior. Yep. And and the next scene we have is the final shot of the movie, which is Owen on a train with a trunk with Abby inside it doing some uh, uh, Morse code on this trunk, and him staring out the window singing the now and later song yep and that's it that is that's let me in um and it's the end of it's very haunting mm-hmm. it, of, of him singing you know have some now save some later it's it uh, it just breaks your heart because again it brings up all the stuff that the original does again regardless of what abby's motive is and i would say it's more pure in this movie but it's still like oh this kid is fucked yeah he's his his life is now in a trajectory that uh we can predict i mean in a way it's probably better than where his life was gonna go previous to this and in some ways at least he has somebody now because before this he was profoundly lonely but it's still a tragic like direction either way yeah like it's going to end badly no matter which way he turns but um yeah so that all right so obviously that brings us to performances in the film there's really only four main characters which is owen abbey the father and the policeman Mm -hmm. and we've all we've touched on this already but i mean what are your thoughts on these lead performances in the film i mean you got two really good child actors here um, they're pretty flawless performances, but I really, really like Jenkins and Kiotis. Uh, I, I, again, I want the movie that's just those two 
you know, the aging serial killer who can't quite get it done anymore. And the world weary cop who's like just sort of dogging him the whole time, Columbo style almost. Um, I kind of really liked that. It was like the things that really stood out for me because I mean, you, you look at, you look at uh, the Owen Abbey thing, those performances are great, but they are pretty much note for note, kind of what you get in the Swedish one too, to a certain degree. Whereas with this version of the film, the Jenkins performance and the Kyoto's performance gives you kind of focuses on two characters that don't really get focused upon in the, in the uh, original film. And I, I kind of liked those differences because uh, like uh, the Virginia, her boyfriend is like the guy who comes after the vampire after she burns up in the, in the hotel, uh, in the hospital, in the or- original, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so like they changed that up a little bit, and I thought they were they were good subtle little changes that sort of worked with the sort of mood and the tone that uh, we're going for here in this one, where it becomes much more a vampire story that has this background of a true crime set in the '80s serial killer kind of film going on in the background, and I really uh, liked that that's what stood out for me the most kind of in this film. So, yeah, I, I agree with all that. I think that the inclusion of the policeman character is really good. I think, yeah, I, I mean, you're right. The, the child performances are very, very good, but Richard Jenkins and Elias Godius are just phenomenal actors mm-hmm. and just seeing them kind of lean into these very somber, sad roles. Yeah. And it's, it's fantastic. Like I, you can recommend this movie just for those performances. Mm-hmm. Of like, even if you, even if you've seen the original, even if even if you're just a Richard Jenkins fan, which I am, yeah, this is a great Richard Jenkins performance. This is a great Elias Codius performance. So like, just watch it for that, and it's still satisfying. Yeah, and it's like everything else is still really fucking top notch and great too so it's not like you're just going for those elements necessarily in the film like you can recommend them on those elements but it's still like oh and there's also this really great film with all these other really good actors in it uh doing their thing too so it's like you have it's it's not like you're gonna just watch those two performances and then everything else is a big heaping pile of shit around it or anything you know (laughs) yeah right right um yeah and okay so let's jump into the the themes because again you know a lot of these are similar to the themes of let the right one in but i think one thing that's very different than you know like in both of these films you have the idea of you know coming of age and and this Mm -hmm. sort of isolation and and finding that person when you're an isolated and lonely kid um but in this one i think there's even more attention paid to the kind of the concept of evil Mm -hmm. and yeah yeah go ahead i was just yeah like some of the things that abby does are unquestionably would be considered evil to you and me but she's doing these things out of necessity and you can see that she has she's not just like a purely an evil soulless husk that's out killing people like she has uh, an instinct for survival yes but she also has really noble and sweet motivations as well when it comes to Owen so like it has so much like gray area in there uh, even compared to the original where it seems much more um, transparent that yeah, she might have some feelings for the character, for the for the boy, but there's a lot of manipulation and there's a lot of possibly even malevolence in that vampire as opposed to Abby in this. Yeah, for sure. And there's all at the very beginning of the movie you get a little bit of Reagan's evil empire speech. Mm-hmm. And it's something that Reeves talked about uh as well that there was a notion in the 80s that evil was purely external it was like america was good it was the shining city on the hill all that stuff Mm -hmm. and then you had evil uh trying to 
infect and invade that. Outside forces, communists, witchcraft. Right, as opposed to the character of Owen, who has all these dark feelings already. Like, the evil... He has... You know, the, the scene with him stabbing the tree is really unsettling because you see this really dark violence brewing inside this kid. It's and, very surprising, right? Because, you know, <laughs> Reagan's America was really good on mental health. Like, you know. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. They, and they didn't cut funding or anything and send uh, yeah, hundreds of thousands of people into the streets. Um, yeah, but, it, right, I mean, it's very much that idea of it, if you're if you're a good upstanding christian american you can't you can't be affected by this stuff right but the character of owen and the father and you know obviously abby herself like th- there is an inherent evil in a lot of their actions and it's this gray area of like yes they're evil but they're also there's an understandable element to the evil things that they do Mm -hmm. And so where does that leave us as a viewer? You know, like this whole movie is about like the ending of this movie is that Owen and Abby now have each other, but Oh dear God, what does that really mean? Yeah. They're, they're going to be traveling around the country, killing people. Right. Right. And so, And, and, and like Owen, he's already got these dark tendencies in him. And he's going to end up like Richard Jenkins, but he might even have more of a, you know, <laughs> an ability to uh, lash out and, and hurt people for Abby. Like, he, he's got a focus now for those sort of dark feelings as well. And and you got to imagine as he ages and Abby doesn't, he's going to run into a lot of the same problems, uh, a lot of the same sort of um, mental struggles that richard jenkins character obviously was going through and man how much more horrific is that when it's in the hands of a kid who was like wearing a translucent mask and stabbing things with a knife before he met abby yeah um, yeah oh yeah it's right is that 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 the very notion of it is harrowing mm-hmm. um all right well let, let, let me kick it over to you first for uh, final thoughts on this movie. Anything that we we haven't addressed that you want to make sure we include in this conversation? Because, you know, like, it's funny to do uh, movies like this after having just recently done a series on Night of the Demons. Yeah. Where it's like, <laughs> you know, those movies are very superficial. They are what they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of them are really fun, but they're not. there's no depth to it. Whereas with this, it's like there's so much meat on the bone. For yeah. both of these films, uh, so yeah, what what was, you know, your, your I, ultimate takeaway here? Um, I think we covered it pretty well, honestly. Like we hit the key points. I would, I would just say, like, if people were sleeping on this, don't. Um, even if you've seen the first one, because there are enough different things going on in this. Like it's still got the same overall structure and stuff, but the themes are slightly different. It's talking about a different place, um, vastly different place compared to the setting in the original film. Um, And at the same time, there's, there's a lot of similarities that you can compare and contrast. And um, I think it's also just a really good precursor to, a lot of these sort of quote unquote prestige horror films that have come in the wake of it. Um, and I don't think it gets enough credit for being kind of a forebearer of some of these uh, better made, big budget, big studio uh, horror films and the like that have gotten so much attention these days. Like a lot of the stuff I saw in this, like I see in things like the witch that came out years later, um, there's definitely a lot about, you know, the uh, the belief of evil is, you know, on the outside and it creeps in. Like, you see a lot of that in The Witch. There's a lot of um, just family dysfunction and dysfunction of the society and the system that's in place where uh, the system only props up those people who succeed and those people who fall to the wayside a little bit. They're left to struggle and there's no support system for them. 
Um, you see that in this, and you see that in films like The Witch, and it does have a lot to say about just evil, the, the evil that is the failure of of a society, like <laughs> 1980s America with Reagan at the at the pulpit, of course, you know. Um, yeah, no, this, this is a great fucking film. Uh, is it as good as the original? <sighs> you could make the argument that it's unneeded, and yeah, possibly it is unneeded, but I think it has enough in it where it uh, its its existence is justified. Yeah, I I agree with all that, and it, it's I really like talking about these movies, especially a remake like this, because I probably came in. In fact, I know I did. I came into this with a slightly lower opinion of it. And then just mm. talking through the movie, I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm just being an asshole because <laughs> I really like let the right one in. But if, if the let the right one in did not exist and, and you only had this movie, mm-hmm. it would be great. Yeah. And, and the first time I saw it, I wasn't down on it or anything, but I think I'm, I'm even, more enamored of it now than I was uh, before we even started this conversation. And because I, I think you're right. I think there, there is a world in which you can say this movie is not necessary, but mm. it's a really good take on the material. And it's different enough that it's definitely Matt Reeves putting his spin on it. Yeah. And, yeah. and so that, yes, it borrows heavily from the original film, but it also takes some elements from the book that were not in the original film it it recontextualizes it in the united states and it has some things to say about that um and i my biggest problem with it other other than the fact that it lives in the shadow of let the right one in which is unfortunate Mm -hmm. but other than that it's just i wish that the level of like somber uh I was going to say slowness and that, that sounds like I'm being derogatory, but that same like measured pace. I wish that that extended to the vampire stuff. Yeah, I agree. Because that's the thing that bums me out most when I watch this movie is like, uh, it I, just let, let this be a little less horrific. And mm-hmm. in a weird way that would make it more horrific if it were slightly more mundane. Yeah, because, I mean, it's got to be mundane for Abby at this point. Like, she's been doing it for so long. Like, you don't get... You don't get the vampire here. You don't get the same vampire you get, like, from 30 Days a Night or whatever, where they're, like, really into, like, fucking people up and, and shit. Like, Abby's not into it. She just has to do it. Yeah. So so when you see those action scenes where she's spider monkeying around... <laughs> okay. uh, it, it feels very jarring and out of place with the rest of the tone. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, well let, let's let's rate this thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna spoil mine right off the bat. Not spoil it. This is the, this is the part of the show we're doing. Um, mm-hmm. But I I probably came into this saying like a solid three and a half stars out of five. But mm-hmm. by the the time we finish this conversation, I'm like, no, this is a four star movie. Um, it, I've got my minor quibbles with it, but mm-hmm. the more we've talked through it, the more I'm like, yeah, the performances are fucking good. And yeah, the tone is, for, with rare exceptions, the tone is right on. And yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a, a great movie. Yeah, no, I'm uh, right there with you. Uh, four to five. Uh, that, that was kind of my thoughts um, coming in for the rewatch too, because I do like this film quite a bit. Um, and talking through it actually just kind of like solidified my opinion of it already. Like it was like, yeah, I'm not stupid. Bo agrees with me on this and this <laughs> and this that I was thinking. So don't, look, yeah. don't let me be your your like exhibit A because I will say some <laughs> dumb shit. I like Night of the Demons two a whole lot. I love that film. Yeah, it's uh, best of the series by far. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, see, Lee, you are a smart cookie. Uh, we're, we're fucking geniuses in here. Get this fucking think tank going already. <laughs> Holy fuck. Uh, all right. So here are three things that you might not know 
Actually, Lee, you probably do if you listen to the same commentary I did, but I still think it's super interesting. And and listeners uh, of the show may not ha- uh, know this about this movie, Let Me In. One, the mask that Owen wears is actually a clear plastic mold of Richard Jenkins' face. Whoa. <laughs> That's freaky as fuck. Yeah. So, yeah, it turns out they, you know, when they were doing the prosthetics for the acid phase, they yeah. had to make a mold of his face, and they were like, well, we need a mask for Owen, so let's just make a plastic mask of Richard Jenkins, which does double duty of being sort of metaphorically like, oh. It's, it puts the meta in metaphorically, does it not? Because yeah. <laughs> yeah, quite good. Quite good. Yeah. Um, uh, this one, less relevant, but still kind of fun. Uh, very notably, when they go to the arcade, there is a Boy George kind of dude behind the counter that mm-hmm. is played by the brother of Chloe Grace Moritz. Yeah. yeah. It's just kind of a, a fun one. And also kind of a fun one, uh, when the one and only time you hear Owen talk to his father in the movie, the voice on the phone is Elias Codius. Yeah, I knew that one. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be fucking weird if it turned out he was his dad? <laughs> right. Like, he he shows up at the apartment. It's like oh that because that's the that could be the strain in the fucking marriage, right? Detectives often have broken marriages and stuff because they're working long hours and they're seeing the worst in society and they don't want to bring it back home and they can't open up to their wives and it just leads to a fracture. Wouldn't that be a weird twist where uh, Owen goes goes to save her and it's like oh shit that's my dad that's that's kind of fucked up that, <laughs> yeah right yeah if if owen watched his father reaching out for him and he was just like mm-hmm. you know what nope sorry yep. dad how about you you can have a big old bag of suck it as fun as that is like the idea of that is that would make this a much more kind of like oh come on <laughs> Yeah, uh, you'd be like, "Oh fuck!" You just fucked this movie a little bit. You just shot in the foot a little bit. Yeah, I lost lost a couple toes. <laughs> and yeah, when Reeves talked about it, he was just like, "Oh, it turns out it's just that Elias Codius and and Cody Smith McPhee got along real well on the set, and so when it came time to have that co- that scene, he was like, "Well, how about Elias just be the actor that you're working against?" Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and they just kept it, you know. The, uh, that's pretty I mean, good. I mean, it works. I mean, you, you hardly hear <laughs> Elias Cody say anything anyway in the film, so it's not like you're going to pick up on it. it. Yeah, it's the most dialogue he has in any given scene mm-hmm. is when he's not playing himself in the movie. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, man. So that is uh, let me in before we uh, pull the plug on this particular Renfield. Let's uh, let's kick it back to you to uh, peddle your wear, sir. Uh, where can people find you uh, and and get more of this sweet sweet Lee action? Yeah, thanks. Um, if you if you want the uh, the on Lee fans uh, uh, version of me, uh, <laughs> that you don't have to you don't have to pay for. Actually, that's 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 me and my girlfriend's joke because we have technically the same name and that it's pronounced the same so we're like always checking oh you want to see our on lee fans um uh go to (laughs) the amateur action is is quite hot yeah uh you go to uh they must be destroyed on site that's tmbdos.podbean.com where you can find uh, my main podcast and the side podcast i talked about uh we cover a little bit of everything we do kind of dip more into like obscure and cult and and stuff that sort of strikes her fancy. A lot of older films. There's a shit ton of silent films we've done in the last couple of years uh, in our feed now. And um, yeah, we just we, we, there's nothing we won't tackle, but we do sort of uh, sort of side on the, uh, the more obscure and older uh, stuff for the most part. Uh, pretty much any genre, though. Excellent. Excellent, man. Uh, well, thank you again. It has been a, a genuine pleasure, and I will same here. I, I will definitely hit you up again in the future for more of these shenanigans. Um, Sweet. I'll try to. I'll, I'll. I'll try to make it remakes only. 
You know, <laughs> like we'll do the Fright Night remake, vampire remakes only. Vampire, Jesus Christ. We'll do uh, <laughs> the Salem Slot with Rob Lowe. Oh my God. Can we just wait till the new Salem Slot comes out? <laughs> no, no, wow. it is Rob Lowe and Andre Bauer or bust. Oh, fuck. <laughs> but at least you get Donald Sutherland in that. That's fun. I guess. Yeah, he is kind of good in that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, buddy. Thanks again. And I'll be right back to wrap up the show. Sweet. All right, you knuckleheads, that is the end of the discussion between me and Lee Russell about Let Me In. I hope that you enjoyed it. I had a wonderful time talking to Lee, and I had a great time talking to Lee about this movie in particular, uh, because I think we both had, you know, as we were exploring the movie, even our perception of it changed. And uh, I hope that in the course of uh, that discussion that maybe your thoughts on Let Me In changed, or at least uh, you were able to... Uh, sort of explore the movie with with us together uh, so that you can, you know, d- look at the movie in a slightly different light, perhaps, uh, than was originally cast on the film, which, like I said, was largely negative. So anyway, what's coming up on the Dark Parade? Well, if you were listening to this, uh, there's going to be a uh, morbid Monday slash Sinister Sunday. You can join us live on YouTube.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. Uh, for the Sinister Sunday part of that. Uh, the Morbid Monday will be the audio version of that discussion that we have uh, on YouTube. And from there, uh, we're going to be launching into a new series, uh, as well as some bonus material that I haven't quite worked out yet because I'm still uh, sort of getting reorganized from uh, taking a week off. It turns out you miss a week, you miss a lot around here. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're not... Uh, going to be doing a lot of uh, special and bonus content that's going to be coming we'll have uh, a heart of horror we'll have a uh, uh, what you watching with jamie and Bo. all that stuff is coming as well as some other stuff some sound some found footage fool stuff uh is sure to find its way in there and i've got some other things brewing some percolating in my brain but uh it's not quite ready to announce yet but that will also be some dark parade shenanigans uh, so join us for the live stuff. The, the next series we're going to be doing is black Christmas. We're going to do all the movies that dare to call themselves black Christmas. And I ain't seen a one of them. So this is going to be exciting because, uh, this is, I, I'm a neophyte to all of this. Some of these movies I understand are not very good and we are going to, uh, enjoy, uh, discussing the ones that aren't very good as well as the ones that are. I've got a great selection of hosts lined up to discuss these movies with me. So I hope you will uh, come back and enjoy our holiday celebration as we dig into these uh, these Black Christmas movies. And uh, in the new year, not entirely sure yet. I'm bouncing around with, it with a couple of ideas. So feel free to hit me up on the social media. Uh, if you would like to recommend something, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Dark Parade Pod. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook or Meta or the Dark Hole of the Universe, whatever it's calling itself now, uh, in the Facebook group, The Dark Parade, uh, which is, you know, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash The Dark Parade. So that will do it for this time around. As always, thank you for uh, rating and reviewing the show where you can. If you're enjoying the show, if you get something out of it, it would really be wonderful if you could drop by iTunes in particular is where that makes the most difference. Uh, be sure to follow the social media channels and, and the like. And most importantly, uh, if you can, just you know recommend the show to some people that, you know, that like horror podcasts if you think they're interested in discussions like this one where it's not just going through the movie scene by scene and saying, yeah, this is awesome, but trying to dig into the movie and explore the themes of the movie and, and see what it's really trying to say. And in fairness, some of the movies we're going to be talking about with these Black Christmas remakes, uh, maybe there's not going to be a lot to say in terms of theme, but uh, that also I find illuminating. When a movie doesn't have anything to say for itself at all uh, is just as much a statement as uh, a statement of theme. So anyway, thanks for all of that. Thanks for sharing the stuff. Uh, You guys are the best. I'm very excited for the new year of the Dark Parade. So go out there, have a great rest of the week, and we will see you next time on the Dark Parade. Talk to you then.